Vesper theory and polarity. That is valence shell electron pair repulsion theory as well as polarity. So we're going to be talking today about how molecules get their shapes and the reasons why some molecules have certain shapes and other molecules have other shapes. We're also going to spin this into polarity discussion as well and discuss how polarity of a molecule has an impact on what it does, what it dissolves, those types of things. Hopefully by the end of this video you will be able to explain why certain molecules have a certain shape. You should also be able to determine the molecular geometry of the molecules given their Lewis structure, as well as differentiate between polar and nonpolar molecules. We've got a few vocabulary terms today. I want to just dive in. Let's get going. So atoms take certain shapes, and these shapes are based on the idea that the valence electrons that are found around the atoms in a molecule repel each other as much as possible. If you think about it, this makes sense when we go back and start thinking about Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law states that opposites attract and similar charges repel. Well, electrons on the outside of an atom or lone pair electrons that are found on an atom are negatively charged, and so they're going to repel other negatively charged particles as much as they possibly can. That's what allows certain shapes to take place. This is known as Vesper theory, which stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Basically states that atoms and lone pairs that surround a central atom or an atom in general are going to repel each other as much as possible, which determines the shape that the molecule take, has. That the shape that the molecule has. So how do we determine this? Well, the first thing you need to make sure that you do is write your Lewis structure correctly. It's very, very important. The next thing you want to do is count up the number of regions of electron density. I will also probably use the term steric number to describe this. This includes the amount of lone pairs and atoms that are attached to your central atom. So you want to count out how many things are attached to it. That includes lone pairs as well as bonded pairs. Each one of those counts as one region of electron density. Based on that information, you also want to take into consideration the number of lone pairs that are present because that has an impact as well. So if we take a look at the chart, let's say we have a steric number of four, but we have three atoms and a lone pair that is attached to the central atom. If we look at the chart over here, we find that the electron pair geometry is tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry is trigonal planar, is trigonal pyramidal. Okay, so we're just going to simply be able to utilize that chart and to be able to draw those. Now you need to think about how those look in three-dimensional space. That's going to be a big difference between this year and last year, is you are going to have to draw these correctly. And we'll get some practice doing that in class. So remember that the repulsion of valence electrons results in different shapes. Now, in some instances, we need to think about whether a, an atom or a lone pair is causing the repulsion. Lone pairs of electrons are going to alter the bond angles slightly due to a higher amount of repulsion than electrons that are found on an atom. So if we take a look at the one on the far left, that is a tetrahedral geometry. It has four atoms that are attached to it and no lone pairs. The bond angle there is 109.5 degrees. If we take a look at the one next to it, you actually have a lone pair of electrons at the top of the nitrogen. Because those lone pair of electrons are more negative than electrons that are bonded to an atom, it actually pushes the atoms downward, even more so than in the tetrahedral before. So the bond angle is slightly less. It's 107.3 degrees. And if we have two lone pairs, like on H2O, you'll see that the bond angle is even smaller, 104.5 degrees. So the electrons actually have more of a repulsion than electrons on atoms do, and that's due to the fact that those electrons are by themselves. It's a pure negative charge, whereas electrons that are on atoms balance out. Though they have a positive charge that's associated with it as well, so the negative doesn't repel quite as much. So our first practice problem here asks us to determine the Lewis structure and geometry for the following molecules. We have CH4, NH3, H2O, and SF6. So the first thing we're going to do is draw out our Lewis structures. Now I'm going to do this relatively quickly, but if you need to follow the steps, make sure you take the steps and take your time, so that way you get these 100% correct. Because if you do not draw the Lewis structures correctly, you are going to get the geometry incorrect. And that's really, really important. And SF6. 
Whew, not going to get much more fun than that. All right, so we need to determine the geometry for the following. So in this case over here, we have CH4. CH4 has a steric number of four because it has four hydrogens that are attached to the central atom. It has no lone pairs, so if you look at the chart, something with a steric number of four with no lone pairs is tetrahedral. Take a look at NH3, has a lone pair on nitrogen. So the steric number here is four, but we have three atoms and a single lone pair. So we take a look at the chart, this is going to be trigonal pyramidal. We have H2O, Again, our steric number here is also four, but we have two lone pair. So if we look at the chart, that is going to be bent. And then SF6 here, take a look at this one, and we look at the chart, we find that it is octahedral. Okay. Now, something you will need to consider as you go through this, and there may be questions that will ask you, is about the bond angles themselves. So it's really important to make sure that we know these, or at the very least, write these down as we look at the chart. Something that is tetrahedral is going to have a bond angle of 109 0.5 degrees. You have to remember that this is in three-dimensional space, so it's not going to look like a square like that, okay? It's going to look a little bit different, and I'll show you that here in just a little bit. Trigonal pyramidal, that's 107 degrees, or around 107. Bent, around 105 degrees. And our octahedral, a little bit different here, it actually has two bond angles that are associated with it. If it's octahedral, you're going to have one that's 120 degrees, and one that's 90 degrees, okay? And again, the key here is just to understand that all of these different bond angles exist and how to determine the shapes of those molecules because that's gonna help us determine the polarity a little bit later on. So when we talk about polarity, our primary focus is the fact that some molecules have an even distribution of electrons, they share them evenly, and some have an uneven distribution of electrons where they share them unevenly. Molecules with an even distribution of electrons are considered nonpolar. Nonpolar molecules have somewhat weak forces between them. Polar molecules have an uneven distribution of electrons. So if we take a look at the molecules here on the right, some are differentiated between polar and nonpolar. It all has to do with the way that you draw your dipole arrows, and we talked a little bit about that in our previous video. The dipole arrows tell us which atom in a bonded pair attracts the pair of electrons that are shared in a covalent bond the most. Between H and Cl, it's clearly Cl. So we draw the dipole arrow pointing to the right. If we think about these as forces acting upon an object, we have to think if the molecule moves. If the molecule moves, then the molecule is polar. So if we look at HCl, arrow points to the right, it moves, therefore it's polar. If we look down here at the bottom, we have polar bonds between B and F. They all point different directions, but if we were to consider those all forces, all of those forces would actually cancel each other out, thus BF3 would not move, therefore it is a nonpolar molecule. So you can have polar bonds and have a nonpolar molecule if the molecule is symmetrical. Okay. Look at the far right side there, you have C's and H's and CCL. Primary direction of the pull of electrons is up, therefore the molecule itself is polar. We'll practice quite a bit with this. But the real key thing you need to keep in mind here is that when you draw your Lewis structures, you need to think about the geometry because the geometry is going to help you determine if things are polar or nonpolar. You'll see what I mean here in a moment. Now bonds are polar if they have an uneven distribution of electrons. Now this is a result of the electronegativity of each atom in the bond differs. So for example, on the right hand side here, you have two carbon atoms. The two carbon atoms are Nonpolar have a nonpolar covalent bond. Reason being is that they have the same electronegativity, so they share electrons equally. However, between O and H, O has a higher electronegativity, and therefore the electrons are going to be shared unequally. Those electrons are going to be closer to oxygen than they will to hydrogen. So if you think about it, all bonds are essentially polar unless the atom is bonded to the same type of atom. Keep that in mind as we go through and determine the polarity of molecules. So how do we determine the polarity of a molecules, whether it's polar or nonpolar? Well, if it's nonpolar, you're going to have either all nonpolar bonds or 
you're going to have polar bonds that cancel each other out. In order for it to be polar, you have to have unbalanced polar bonds in the molecule. Or you have unbalanced lone pairs on the central atom. Again, it's essential to take a look at the geometry to determine if this is the case. So now it's asking us to determine the Lewis structure, geometry, and polarity for the following molecules. Now I'm not going to do all of these just for time purposes. However, I do want to go through and look at some of these to help us get an idea of how do we determine the polarity of the molecule. So let's start with CH4. Okay. Again, draw our Lewis structure. Our geometry, based on that, is tetrahedral. You can look at the chart to be able to figure that out. Now something that's kind of important here is you want to make sure that we're able to draw this in three dimensions as well. Okay, so that gets a little bit tricky when we start talking about tetrahedral molecules. So one way I like to do this is to draw something like that. Okay, that means that it's coming out at you. All right, so the molecule is actually coming towards you. The other H's are going to be here. Okay, so if you actually hold up a three-dimensional molecule of methane, CH4, it would look something similar to this. You want to be able to think about it again in three dimensions. The next step, determine the polarity of the molecule. In order to do this, let's look at our dipole arrows. Dipole arrows point towards higher electronegativity, so between carbon and hydrogen. Let's make those a different color, shall we? Make those green. We're going to point them this way, this way, this way, and that way. Okay. So if you think about the structure, all of those are going to cancel they all have the same difference in electronegativity. This molecule is nonpolar. Let's look at H2O. Okay. So H2O, we do our Lewis structure. We find out that the geometry is bent. Okay. Now, if you look at the structure the way I've drawn it, and that's the way a lot of people I see draw these things, is that it's not really bent when you draw this. So you need to go through and actually, again, redraw your structure the way it looks in the diagram. Okay, so you want to make sure that you draw it bent. Reason being is that if we look at this molecule here, our dipole arrows point both towards the center, but they also both point up. That means that the molecule will move, so this is polar. If you thought about it like this, you might consider that to be nonpolar because you may think that those cancel each other out. So it's really important that you take the geometry into consideration and draw it appropriately so that way you can determine the polarity of the molecule much, much easier and also get it correct. Let's do a couple more. CO2, again we draw our Lewis structure correctly. The steric number for that is 2. Remember, we're talking about atoms and lone pairs attached to your central atom. So this is linear. So it's drawn correctly. I get my dipole arrows. They're going to point towards oxygen. They cancel each other out. So this molecule, nonpolar. CH3Cl. It's a funky looking bond. Again, we do use our geometry chart and find that that is tetrahedral. Let's draw this using correct geometry. Now let's draw our dipole arrows. Point towards higher electronegativity. Oops. Yeah, that'll work. Now a lot of these look like they cancel, but both of these dipole arrows point down. Okay? So the molecule is going to be polar. All right? And the amount of arrows pointing in a specific direction also tells you how polar something is. So something can be more polar than another. So for example, if we have something like HCl versus H The difference in electronegativity between H and F is greater and therefore would be more polar than something like HCl. Okay? So do keep those things in mind as we move forward with some practice problems in class. A little bit of a lengthy video this time out, but again, take each step at a time. Remember, you have to get your Lewis structures correct to get your geometry.
and your geometry needs to be correct in order to do your polarity. Also think about how you're going to draw those molecules in three-dimensional space. We'll talk to you later next time, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.